Martin Luther wrote these words, God writes the gospel not in the Bible alone, but also in flowers. Now, I put three dots in there because he added a whole lot more things that God created in his statement. But for our purposes today, God writes the Gospels not just where? In the Bible, but Martin Luther believed he also wrote his Gospels in the what? The flowers. Do you enjoy flowers? Flowers are beautiful things. Uh, My wife grows flowers in our front flower bed each year, and they are beautiful, but I take those for granted. I don't notice them very often, but when I notice flowers the most is when I'm out in the woods and there are wildflowers around. It is just a gorgeous thing to me to see a whole hillside that are just covered with all of these beautiful different colors of wildflowers, and you can just imagine the pleasure that God took in creating the beauty. Now, if you go for walks with me, especially now that we have cell phones that can take pictures at any place, you will know that I stop often to take pictures of flowers on the ground because I find them beautiful to look at and I like going back and looking at them again. I am not a person who knows what I am looking at or taking a picture of. I just take pictures of them and they're beautiful. Somebody out there probably knows the name of what these flowers are. Or maybe somebody don't, doesn't know that, but I don't have any idea what they are. If you know, uh, you can fill me in. But God has an abundance of beauty out in nature, doesn't he? In the flowers that he has created. Um, look at that. The, the dark purple lines on there with the green, isn't that gorgeous? God made that for us. And Martin Luther would remind us that in this, somehow, God teaches us the what? It says he can teach us the gospel through these things. This was just from a few weeks back on our church hike that we took, a uh, pilot uh, area, and we went to, what was it, Monument Rock or whatever it was called, something like that. What's that? History Rock. There you go. There was a lot of history on it, not very old history, a lot of people who just were writing their names on a rock, which was kind of cool, but I found it far cooler up on top of the mountain in many ways, and, and there were these flowers up there, this one as well. But God makes some beautiful things. Even things that I try to kill in my yard uh, can be beautiful when they're out in nature, right? Uh, Dandelions can be a beautiful thing as long as they're not within my fence line. Um, And even when they're not much alive anymore. Now this one, as Montanans, we all should recognize. You know what this is? This is the bitterroot, our state flower, if you didn't know. Um, and this was down in Yellowstone last year, taken with my little cell phone. Pretty cool thing. And there's my favorite, Indian paintbrush, where I will be heading later today up in the Swan to our, my folks' cabin up there. There is paintbrush that at times is the color of these lilies, just a fire orangey yellow. Sometimes it is almost a bright fluorescent pink, sometimes burgundy, sometimes red as you see there. Just a gorgeous thing, but I love it when you see a hillside that is covered with paintbrush and all of these other flowers. But if we were to listen to the words of Martin Luther and understand that God somehow teaches us the gospel through the flowers, and we were to try to think, okay, what flower would it be that God would choose, perhaps as his favorite flower, to teach us the gospel? And there is one flower that is named numerous times in scripture. Now, Linda sent me a a text yesterday afternoon, bless her heart, she does our bulletin, and she saw the sermon title, and asked if I would like some I think tiger lily, right? And so she has some right here. And the lily is in the Bible numerous times. And we're going to talk about that today. And we're going to see the gospel in the lily. Now, the lily I want to show you today is this one. Does anybody know the name of that flower on the screen? It is a glacier lily. Or sometimes it is referred to as a a yellow avalanche lily. Um, these lilies come up just as the snow begins to melt away. Um, If you're interested in seeing them and not going very far from here, 
New World Gulch just up by the academy where you take off to go to Mount Ellis when the snow is first receding. You can go up there and find some meadows that are literally solid yellow with these lilies, and it is a beautiful, beautiful thing to see. You have to be careful if you're in the area where these go because in the springtime when the snow is first receding, there are some big furry creatures that walk around and come out of their dens, such as grizzly bears and black bears that really love to eat the bulbs under the ground of these glacier lilies. They take their nice long claws and dig down through the dirt and scoop up the ends of the bulbs and they eat those. The deer and the elk like what's on top because they eat the flower and, and the greenery that goes with it. Those are the bulbs there that the bears like to eat. Uh, but the bears aren't the only ones that like to eat them. Native Americans early on in their history, I don't know if they do it today, but they would take these bulbs and put them in their stews and soups and thought that they made them a whole lot better to eat. And so if you want to try something unique in your stew next spring, you can go pick some glacier lily bulbs. Um, but they didn't only use them for that. They would mash them up and they would put them on boils and cuts for healing. They would also use them as we would if you had a cold or some kind of a respiratory problem. And just interesting, all the different uses of them. That doesn't have much color left to it. But you know when that glacier lily was picked? 1806. Some of us press flowers in books occasionally. This is the equivalent of that. Meriwether Lewis on Lewis and Clark's expedition through this area picked a glacier lily. And that is it right there, still preserved to this day, not very well preserved, but what is left of it, a glacier lily that was picked back in 1806. He wrote extensively about this because he was amazed at how easily he was able to determine on their journey through the beginning of spring because when these flowers came up, it meant winter was officially what? It was over because these flowers only come up when the snow has receded. Now, not that you're going to get a few, not going to get a few snowflakes after that, but they truly believe that this was a sign of spring. And this is the part that I think is, is pretty cool to see when you find a field that is full like that. And trust me, you can go find a couple small meadows up New World Gulch that don't look too far from that. They're just solid yellow and beautiful. And so the lily. Interesting things we can learn about it. It is a beautiful thing to look at. But what is there in this flower that God has created us that teaches us the gospel? In your Bibles, I would have you turn with me today to the book of Song of Solomon. Now, I will tell you that you don't get to hear from this book in sermon time very often. That is because a lot of what you read in the book of Song of Solomon would probably make most preachers, including myself, blush to read several of the verses are there. Um, it is a love story, a love dialogue believed to be between Solomon in his very young age, before he had the numerous, numerous wives he ended up with, uh, with one of his very early on brides, and there is a great deal of of love and affection that comes out in this book. Today, our world tends to notice all of the physical aspects that Solomon writes about there and his bride as well. But God would have us understand that those are just characteristics of a love from the heart. And because of that, Song of Solomon is also used as an allegory or a parable that speaks of God's love, the love of Jesus for his bride or his church. And so today I'd have you turn with me to Song of Solomon, chapter 2, page 669. If you haven't found it yet and are looking in your pew Bible there. And we're just going to look at the first two verses here. Song of Solomon, or Song of Songs, maybe your Bible says, uh, chapter 2 and verses 1 and 2. It says, I am a rose of Sharon, a lily of the valleys. 
Verse 2, like a lily among thorns is my darling among the maidens. There is some debate here that verse 1 is the words of the bride, whereas verse 2 are that of the groom. But most people believe that both of these verses come from the groom to the bride. Now, if we're going to look at this in the sense of the gospel today and Jesus speaking to our hearts, we will look at this as these are the words of Jesus to who? His church. And so Jesus would say to us today, I am a rose of Sharon. I am a lily in the valleys. Like a lily among thorns is my darling among the maidens. This lily among the thorns or the darling among maidens is Jesus' reference to us as his believers or the church today. Now, it's an interesting thing because there is a contrast there. If you look at those flowers up there, if you look at these beautiful lilies here, there is a big difference in them and what we would see in this other picture, a dry, dry, tangled mess of thorns is what the actual language is portraying. Those are two very different things, and Jesus is making a contrast. He is telling his church, you are like this beautiful lily compared to what? The thorns. Now, an interesting thing happens here because the thorns Jesus is referring to, who do you think that represents? It is the rest of the world, those who are not believers in Jesus Christ. So what Jesus is saying to us today, if we are believers in Jesus Christ, in his eyes, we appear to be as what? Lilies among the thorns. This has led some people to ask the question, does this mean that Jesus loves us quote unquote, as believers more than he does the rest of the world? Does Jesus look at us today as being superior in some way to the rest of the world? What would you say to those questions? You think Jesus loves you more than he loves the rest of the world? You think Jesus thinks you are somehow better because you're a Christian than the rest of the world? I think if we read the Bible, we would find the answers to that question would be a very, very big no to both of them. The Bible says, for God so loved how much of the world? The whole world that how much of the world could believe in him? All the world could believe in him and ultimately have what? Eternal life. Romans chapter 5 tells us that while we were all enemies, while we were all thorns, Jesus did what for us? He died for us. And that brings up an important point because In this picture that Jesus is painting for us, if there are any lilies among the thorns, we have to recognize that those lilies once were what themselves? They were once thorns. So Jesus doesn't love us anymore. In fact, the Bible makes it clear that he causes the rain to fall and the sun to shine on the righteous as well as the unrighteous. If he doesn't love us more, if he doesn't hold us up in some esteem above the others, the next question would be, is can you and I as Christians experience the love of God in a different way than those who don't believe? In other words, does my relationship, my love for God change how I can experience God's love? And I think that's what God is driving at here as Solomon is writing. Turn with me over to the book of Ephesians chapter 5. And we want to look at verses 21 to 27. Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 21 to 27. Page 1159 in your pew Bible there. Ephesians chapter 5 and verses 21 to 27. Now if you're a Seventh-day Adventist and have been awake for the last five years Uh, this verse or these passages have been used over and over again as we have talked about the headship of Christ. I will tell you that the majority of the time that we read these verses, we don't read verse 21. 
Perhaps it's because in your Bibles, like mine, there is a division between verse 21 and 22 where they put a heading. And so we just assume if we're going to read these verses, we'll start at a logical place below the heading. But if you read verse 21, you will find that whoever put the heading in there missed the boat. Because if they're going to split anything up, it should have come before verse 21. Because in verse 22, we begin to talk about submission. And men sometimes get a little bit excited with the first line that we read in verse 22 because it says, wives, you are to submit to your husbands. And that sounds really good if I've left out verse 21. So we start in verse 21 today. Verse 21 says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. So who do you suppose he's talking to? Husbands and wives. It is a mutual what? Submission. The other thing we have to understand about this verse is God is not talking about marriage for us as human beings, although it can be used for that. He's very clear at the end of this chapter that he is talking about the relationship between Jesus Christ and his what? And his church. And so first and foremost, that's how we read it today. So verse 21, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Verse 22, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. And then verse 25, it kind of turns the tables a little bit here because it says, Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy cleansing her by the washing with water through the word and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any blemish. Now, is that a pretty high standard that God has given for his people who are in relationship with him? The point of these verses that I would have us see today is is God is talking about a mutual submission here. And if we're talking about the church, first and foremost, Christ submitted himself to who? To his father, but also to us as his bride, did he not? Did he not submit to take upon himself all of my sins and imperfections? If he didn't do that, I'm in serious trouble. So there is a submission that Jesus makes. And if we understand this, even though it begins with wives submit to your husbands, the order of what happens here is very clear. I will never submit to Jesus until I see first in my life through the Holy Spirit the love that Jesus gave me. In other words, if there is going to be any relationship, any love between Jesus and his church, it begins first because Jesus loved me. I love because Jesus first loved me. But let's look at the picture of what happens here because it is talking about us submitting our lives as followers of Jesus Christ into a loving relationship with him. When we do that, God does something to us. Because let me ask you a question. Verse 27, how many of you today outside of Jesus Christ are without stain, without sin, and without blemish, and holy. How many of you are that way outside of Jesus? There are none of us that are that way. And yet, in a relationship with Jesus Christ, what does it say happens to us? All of a sudden, Jesus, when we are in relationship with him, comes into our hearts, and he wipes away our sins, washes away the stain, takes away our blemishes, and we stand before God as being what? It says we stand before him as being holy. So as opposed to those who don't believe, we who do believe experience God's love in a different way. We experience, when we enter into this relationship with Jesus, we experience a transformation in our lives because we go from being thorns and unholy into being lilies of the valley, something very beautiful in God's eyes. Look over with me to John chapter 14 now, and we want to look at verses 21 and 23. Keeping along the same lines here, 
the benefit of being in relationship with Jesus. John chapter 14 and verse 21, and then we'll jump down to verse 23. Page 1068 here, John 14, verse 21 and 23. Verse 21 says, Whoever has my commands and obeys them is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I too will love him and show myself to him. Now, if we're not careful with this verse, it would almost appear that we have to love God before he what? Before he loves us. That's not what Jesus is saying here. We need to understand what Jesus is saying. When we enter into a loving relationship with Jesus, it is only because of the Father's love for us But when we do that, we are transformed and we begin to live a different life. We are now obeying his commands as opposed to the opposite, right? Look down at verse 23 because this one says essentially the same thing but adds something very cool to it. Uh, Verse 23, Jesus replied, if anyone loves me, he will do what? He will obey me, obey my teaching, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Anybody want Jesus to come make his home with you? Should be the desire of our hearts today, right? And that can only happen if we are what? Obedient? Is that what it's saying? Again, let's read it very carefully here. In light of what the rest of the Bible says, in light of what we read in Revelation or in, not in Revelation, but in Ephesians chapter 5, we only love Jesus because he first did what? He loved us. And when we enter into this loving relationship with Jesus, there is a transformation that takes place in our hearts. Ellen White wrote it this way in Signs of the Times way back in 1876. And I want you to listen carefully what she says here. There was a beautiful pink flower in the garden called the Rose of Sharon. I remember approaching it and touching its delicate petals reverently. They seemed to possess a sacredness in my eyes. My heart overflowed with tenderness and love for these beautiful creations of God. I could see divine perfection in the flowers that adorned the earth. God tended them. And his all-seeing eye was upon them. He had made them and called them good. Ah, thought I, if he so loves and cares for the flowers that he is decked with beauty, how much more tenderly will he guard the children who are formed in his image? I repeated softly to myself. Now listen carefully to what she says here. I repeated softly to myself, I am a child of God. His loving care is around me. I will be obedient and in no way displease him, but will praise his dear name and love him always. Because of what Jesus had done for her, Because of the love of Jesus that she could see, by the way, where did she see this love? She saw it in a flower, didn't she? The gospel, as Martin Luther said, visible in a what? A flower. And because she sees that love of Jesus and understands that love, she desires to enter into what kind of a relationship with Jesus? One that is a submission of herself and her love to Jesus. And therefore, there is a transformation that is going to come in her life. Now, I want to ask you a question. She says, I might be obedient, or did she say, I will be? I will be obedient. Did she say, well, in most ways, I won't displease him? She says, in no way will I do what? Displease him. Is that a reality for the rest of her life from 1876 till she died? Do you think she never did anything that was displeasing to God or and was always obedient for those years? What do you think? Don't be shy. 
Oh, nobody's perfect. Well, you know what? I would disagree with that. Because I think it shows the true intent of her heart and what she felt for Jesus. And because of that, Jesus, in turn, would look at her as would God, as if she had never, what? Sinned, and as if she stood perfect, holy, blameless, without spot, without wrinkle, before God. What is the intent of your heart today? Do you love Jesus with all of your heart? I will tell you something about the desire of my heart today personally. There have been some that have misunderstood the desire of my heart. The desire of my heart in my relationship with Jesus Christ is that from this day, this moment and every moment forward, I would never ever sin again, but I would be totally obedient to Jesus Christ. And that in my heart of hearts, as I look at how much my Savior loves me and what he has done for me, there is nothing in my heart in the slightest way that wants to do the slightest thing to displease him. Does that mean I will never do it again? Absolutely not. But I will tell you, because Jesus knows my heart, and Jesus knows the desire of my heart, I stand before you today in God's eyes as perfect right now as if I had never sinned. Not in a solitary thing that I have done, or will ever do, or will ever attain, but perfectly in the holy and righteous blood of Jesus Christ, big explanation point in 25 periods. I don't want to sin in my life. I do not believe that I am going to keep sinning for eternity or until Jesus comes. We have never preached that from this pulpit. I will tell you the desire of this heart is to be a faithful follower of Jesus Christ. And there is a story in the Bible of a man named Peter who liked to tell those around him how good of a disciple he was. Right down to the point where he told Jesus Even against Jesus' own words, I will never deny you, Jesus. You are not telling the truth about me because you don't know me, Jesus. I will stand up for you. I will die with you. I will die for you. I will never deny you. And within a few short hours, three times, Peter proved that Jesus knew his heart. And then on the beach of Galilee, a little over a month later, Jesus was walking side by side with Peter. And he turned to him and he said, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's answer wasn't, God, you know I love you. I would die for you. I'll never deny you. I'm going to be a perfect person. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Peter just said something very simple and very profound. Lord, you know. You know my heart. You know that I love you. I can't show it all the time. I can't even live it all the time, Jesus. And it breaks my heart that you have to even ask me this question. But God, you know my heart. And all I can tell you today is that Jesus knows my heart. And he is the only one that matters.
when it comes to this heart. Because he knows what's here. And I have a question for you today. Does Jesus know your heart? He does. And when he looks at your heart, does he see a heart that loves him above everything else? Does he see a heart that even at the mention of the name Jesus, that heart is warm to a place where you know that that is your only hope and that is the only thing that really matters in all of this world? Now, your heart isn't going to act like that all the time, but your heart can know that. And Peter understood that. And what Jesus is looking for today is a few lilies among the thorns who aren't concerned with proclaiming that I'm a lily and you're not, but who are concerned in their hearts because they know the love of Jesus and the desire of their heart is to do everything possible to be pleasing to Christ Jesus. But the story doesn't end here in Song of Solomon chapter 2. Because you see in verse 1, Jesus says, I am the rose of Sharon, and I am a lily among the valleys. And then he turns to his bride, and he says, you are also a what? What does he call us? Does he not call us a lily as well? What Jesus is telling us is that when we believe in Jesus Christ, when we submit to him into a loving relationship with him, when he transforms our life, we then go out into a world of thorns bearing the image of who? Of Jesus Christ. He is saying in a true submissive relationship where Jesus has already submitted to you and to his Father and you have submitted to him, When you live your life in the world that we live in today, among the thorns, that as they look at us, they will see, not Jim, not any of you, but they will see who? Jesus Christ, because we bear the image of a lily, because we have been loved by the lily. And we, in return, have given our love to Jesus Christ. In your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. We're going to see this played out. Matthew chapter 6, verses 28 and 29. Another place in Scripture where Jesus uses the lily to teach us very much the gospel message. Matthew chapter 6 and verses 28 and 29. Page 961, Matthew chapter 6 and verses 28 and 29. It says, and why do you worry about clothes? See how the lilies of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all of his splendor was dressed like one of these. Now we read this verse normally and we look at it and there is a very, very profound truth here. If Jesus clothes these lilies or those lilies with the beauty that he has, how much more so is he going to take care of us? Do you believe that today, that Jesus will meet all of your needs, all the crises, all the problems that come up in your life? Do we need to worry about them? No, all we need to do is we can see the gospel in the flowers. We can look at what Jesus does with these things and understand, you know what? If he cares that much about them, if he takes care of these the way he does, how much more is he going to take care of me no matter what I face? That's God's love for me. That's what makes me want to love God back because he has shown over and over again that I don't have anything to worry about in this life because God's got it covered and he's going to take care of me. But there is something else that we have to recognize in these verses here, something a little more subtle, but every bit is important because it says God clothes the lilies of the field and not even the splendor of who? Not even the splendor of Solomon can compare to that. Well, what is the splendor of Solomon? What is Jesus talking about there? Do we know what the splendor of Solomon is? Do we read this verse and just say, well, Jesus is going to take care of me? Well, let's go find out what the splendor of Solomon is. 
keep your finger in Matthew here. We're going to come right back, but go back to with me to 1 Kings chapter 10, and we want to look at verses 4 through 9. 1 Kings chapter 10, verses 4 to 9, page 339. Again, 1 Kings chapter 10, and we're going to start here with verse 4. It says there, When the queen of Sheba saw all the wisdom of Solomon and the palace he had built and the food on his table and the seating of his officials and the attending servants in their robes and his cupbearers and the burnt offerings he made at the temple of the Lord, she, my Bible says, was overwhelmed. This is the splendor of Solomon. It was his kingdom from his palace to the temple and everything in between. It was above anything that anybody had ever seen before. And it goes on, she said to the king, verse 6, The report I heard in my own country about your achievements and your wisdom is true, but I did not believe these things until I came and saw them with my own eyes. Indeed, not even half was told me. In wisdom and wealth, you have far exceeded the report that I heard. Verse 8, how happy your men must be. How happy your officials who continually stand before you and hear your wisdom. And then verse 9, and listen carefully to what she says here. Praise be to Solomon. You have made this place a delight. You have made it greater than anything else. Is that how your Bible reads? There's no mention of Solomon. She has seen all the splendor of his kingdom, and yet when it's all said and done, there's only one thing that she's seen. Verse 9 in the way it really reads. Praise be to To who? To the Lord, your God, who has delighted in you and placed you on the throne of Israel. Because of the Lord's eternal love for you, or for Israel, he has made you a king to maintain justice and righteousness. And all the splendor that she saw in Solomon and the righteousness of Jesus. Now that's pretty cool, isn't it? Solomon had some pretty spectacular things. He did some pretty spectacular things. But when this foreigner, when this unbeliever came into his land and saw his kingdom, she saw who? Jesus Christ. Now flip back to Matthew chapter 12, and we want to look at verse 42. Just a few pages from where we were back in Matthew 6. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 42. And look at what it says here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom. So who is the queen of the south? It's the queen of Sheba. We just read about her. She came to listen to Solomon's wisdom. And now one greater than Solomon is what? Is here. Interesting. She came to see Solomon, and in all his splendor, she saw who? Jesus. And now one greater than Solomon is standing right in front of these Jewish people. And Jesus is telling them something. He's telling them, you're more concerned about being Abraham's seed. You're more concerned about whether you've been circumcised. You're more concerned about whether you're keeping the Sabbath right. You're more concerned about all of these things. And because of it, one greater than Solomon, one more beautiful than Solomon could ever dream to be in all of his splendor, is standing right in front of you. And you do not see Jesus. And therefore, the Queen of Sheba who came and saw Solomon's splendor, far less than that of Jesus, and who saw God in that and praised God in it, is going to sit in judgment over you, Israel, because of what she saw in the splendor of Solomon. Interesting, isn't it? So as ones who bear the image of God because we have been transformed by the loving God that we now have entered into a relationship with him, do we not have opportunity to stand before the world and have the world see in us Jesus? 
and praise the name of Jesus and see his righteousness? A couple more quotations that I want to read as we close here. The first from Charles Spurgeon. He was a great pastor, whether he was, in the words of our lesson today, one of us or not, if you studied your lesson. I want you to listen to his words, and then I'm going to read a quote from Ellen White from Review and Herald, and I want you to listen to how the Holy Spirit was influencing them to hit the same point, even using the same words. Charles Spurgeon, such is a sanctified believer talking about the lily among the thorns. There is a secret something about him, a hallowed savor. Think about that phrase and hold on to it, which goes out from his life so that his graciousness is discovered for grace like it's the Lord's. So in other words, the grace in the believer's life because of their relationship with Jesus appears to be the grace of who? The grace of Jesus Christ himself. Would you like to be perceived as having the grace of Jesus in your life today? That's a pretty high standard, isn't it? It goes on to say, when I was resting, he shares an experience here in the south. I wandered by the side of a flowing stream, gathering handfuls of maidenhair fern from the verdant bank. As I walked along, I was conscious of a most delicious fragrance all around me. I cast my eye downward and saw blue eyes looking up from among the grass at my feet. The violets had hidden themselves from sight, but they had betrayed themselves by their delicious scent. I want you, dear Christians, so now he turns from his experience to me and to you today. I want you, dear Christian people, to be just like this, to have about you a surpassing wealth of blessing and an unrivaled sweetness of the influence by which you shall be known of all men. And where does that fragrance and influence come from, by the way? It is Christ Jesus within you, isn't it? We don't have to stand up and proclaim to the world, look at me and look at what I am or what I might become. We simply have a relationship with Jesus in which his life becomes evident in ours. A sweet fragrance, savor to the world around us. Review and herald here. We need Jesus, the rose of Sharon, to beautify the character and make our lives fragrant with good works so that we shall be the savor of Christ unto God. Let us trust in him, let us confide of him, talk of his love, tell of his power, and then listen carefully. Lift him up, the man of Calvary. Oh, lift him up that all may behold him. John chapter 3. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, we'll do what? Draw all men unto me. As we read that last quote, as those who bear the image of God, as we come into a loving relationship with Jesus, as our lives are transformed into his likeness, we become those who bear the image or the character of Christ to the world around us. Our purpose why God has called us into this relationship outside of saving and transforming my life is also that the world, the thorns around us, might see who lifted up? Jesus. And if Jesus is lifted up in your life, what is Jesus' promise? What does Jesus say? If I be lifted up, what's going to happen? All men will be drawn to me. Do you believe Jesus today when he says that? So do you believe in your life today that if because of your love for Jesus and because Jesus is living through you and produces this picture of who he is to the world, do you believe Jesus can draw all men to him through you today, through us as a church? Do we believe that church? It's an amazing thing that God designs to do through each one of our lives. But we will only experience it 
as we enter into a loving relationship, as we submit our hearts and our lives to Jesus Christ. It is the only way that it's going to happen. A couple more amazing facts about the glacier lily. Bumblebees hibernate. And when they come out of hibernation, they are in need of something. And this wonderful God that we serve in all of his wisdom and majesty and holiness as a creator designed that just as the bumblebee would come out of hibernation, that time when winter slips into spring, that that exact time there would be glacier lilies coming up out of the ground to be a source for them, that which they need to survive. That lily is lifted up, and it draws to it those who are in need. Far more spectacular is the broad-tailed hummingbird who travels from Central America to the region in which we live every single spring for a short period where it nests, raises its young, and then travels all the way back to Central America. Most humans don't go through that to produce offspring. All that way. And lo and behold, when the broad-tailed hummingbird gets to the area in which we live, to begin this cycle year in and year out, when that broad tail hummingbird arrives is the exact time that God is lifting up out of the ground, the glacier lily. And it becomes one of their main sources of food when they get here. How in the world would that happen? A bird traveling all the way from Central America would show up just in time for a glacier lily to be coming up. Do we serve a wonderful God? Yeah. And when he lifts up those lilies, it does what? It draws to them. Today, as you and I make a decision in our hearts as to whether we will submit our hearts to Jesus and enter into a loving relationship with him, that's a decision we have to make. But when we do that, understand that God will do something in your heart. And I would pray that that is the desire of your heart today, to be transformed, to be made into the likeness of Jesus Christ, that our heart's desire would be that of a young lady who wrote a long time ago that when she saw the the rose of Sharon and God's handiwork in that flower determined, you know what, if God loves that that much... How much more does he love me? And when I see that love of God, there is a desire in my heart to do everything to please him. I never again want to do anything to displease him. I never again want to do anything except obey what he has called me to do. And if that is your heart today, do you realize what God is longing to do through you? You stand as a lily among thorns. And the character of Jesus Christ himself will be lifted up in your life. And Jesus' promises do not come back empty or void. Every one of his promises are a yes in Christ Jesus. And As we stand today in Jesus Christ, he will draw those to us. Are you thankful that You don't have to be a thorn, that you can be a lily. I pray to God that you not only desire that experience, but you live that experience. And I pray to God that we, as God's bride, his church, those that bear the image of Jesus will allow him to live his life through us and through us to draw 
all men to him.